In the modern world, we're seeing a great interest in the last 20 years in posture, movement, breath control, and it's appearing in the forms of different types of modern yoga, martial arts, dance, qigong, tai chi. These are popular activities. And um, the question arises as to what is original movement? And what is the most functional movement to make? What are the characteristics of original movement? Where does it come from? And what are its potential effects? As a physiotherapist and a long time yoga practitioner, what I've come to after many years of personal practice and with thanks to all my fantastic teachers I've had for the last 50 years, original movement in terms of how movement originates in a traditional healthy bodied person starts at the core. And original movement in my understanding and the way I teach has got four main principles. Movement starts at the core. It means before any other part of the body makes a movement, the core has moved there first. Now, when I say the core, the core often is thought to be the abdomen, but actually the core is the core of your body. It's probably physically located as a minute speck of infinitesimal nothing right in the center between your navel, the lumbar fifth vertebrae, the top of the hips, the iliac crests, and the pelvic floor between the pubic bone and the tailbone, just slightly higher up. Perhaps we could locate it even between the diaphragm and the pelvic floor. And this place is where movement starts from. Now, in uh, China, they call this the Dantian, and all internal martial arts starts from the Dantian. In Japan, they call it the Hara, and all of the uh, internal energy arts of Japan always talk about breathing from the Hara, moving from the Hara. In China, you breathe from the Dantian, you move from the Dantian. In Indian yoga, which I'm more familiar with than the other systems, we talk about the Manipura chakra, which is located between the L5, L4 region and the navel, inside. Uh, and they also talk about the Kanda, and the Kanda is this amorphous bulbous root center which is also an energy center. In Western physiotherapy, which I'm a physiotherapist, uh, we talk about engaging the lower abdominal muscles before making a movement. This is often very confused. And uh, in the last 25 years, a lot of misunderstanding has come with this expression, draw your abdomen in toward your spine, or draw your lower abdomen in toward the spine. The research by Australian physiotherapists in the 1980s showed fairly conclusively that if a person has a healthy back, for example, no back pain, before their hand moves to reach an object to pick it up, their lower abdominal muscles and the associated muscles of pelvic floor and the lower back will engage first, then the hand moves. Whereas in an unhealthy person, a person, say, with a bad back, they will move their hand first to pick up, say, a heavy object, and then their lower abdominal region will follow the hand. And so what it seems, and this evidence piled up and it's more and more understood now, that before anything happens in the body with the motor system, arms and legs, legs etc., the lower abdomen has to have some sort of engagement first. So natural movement, original movement, originates in the brain with a thought. Then the lower abdomen becomes in some way engaged to do some sort of activity, perhaps moving toward the left, and then the arm will move to the left. You can find this with many examples, and you can even try and see if this works for yourself. If, for example, you lift up your chin, 
It works better if as the chin lifts up, or just before the chin lifts up, your abdomen, the front of the core, expands first. So if I breathe into the abdomen, expand my abdomen, and move my throat forward, chin up, that feels good. But if I restrict the core by pulling my navel in toward the spine with my exhale muscles, and then try and lift the chin, that causes neck discomfort. Similarly, if I try and push a heavy object to my left, if I push with my hand, I feel strain on my shoulders and don't feel strong. But if I move my core to the left first and then push with my hand, my arms are much stronger. This is a principle used in most fighting arts, especially internal martial arts. It's the same principle that we use in yoga, where if I'm trying to lift up, say, to a handstand, then as I put my hands on the floor, I'll make my core move towards my hands first, breathe into my core, and then lift up my legs. If, on the other hand, I move my core away from my hands and pull in my tummy and breathe into my chest, there's very little power. People can still lift up to a handstand any number of ways, but by moving from the core, by breathing from the core, this helps make the movement so much more accessible. And this, I believe, is the way that, that uh, original movement was first happening. And unfortunately, in the West today, most people have lost the connection with original movement because of their lifestyle. So the lifestyle in the West is pretty much five to 15 hours a day of sitting on chairs. And when you sit in chairs five to 15 hours a day, the front of the hips become very tense and compressed, leading to all sorts of hip problems in later life. And the lumbar spine becomes very compressed around L5S1, which pretty much blocks access to your energy center, the Manipura chakra. And often what people are told to do in the West is to draw the navel to the spine in a way which does not engage the abdomen the way the physiotherapist thought. There was some confusion when they first said, draw the navel to the spine. They didn't then realize that when you pull the navel to the spine, it can happen in four main ways. You can pull the navel to the spine using the lower transverse abdominus, as I'm doing here. My lower abdomen is going in, but my upper abdomen is totally relaxed. You can also pull the navel to the spine using the exhalation muscles, the muscles of forced abdominal exhalation, which causes inhibition of the diaphragm. Or you can pull the navel to the spine using an expansion of the chest, which means then also you probably usually inhibiting the diaphragm. Or you can pull the navel to the spine using the muscles that you'd use, for example, to make a half sit up, the rectus abdominis or the oblique muscles. All of them on the outside look like you're pulling the navel to the spine, but the only one which was really being looked at and studied by the physiotherapist of the 1980s, who said that this is part of original movement, is the transversus abdominis. And that's this lower belt muscle, which I can either isolate the lower abdomen like this, where the upper abdomen is out and soft, or the upper abdomen, where the lower abdomen is out and soft, but to do this, this abdominal rolling, which you might see in belly dancers, say, for example, and which you do see in uh, experienced Hatha yogis and uh, Chinese internal arts masters, etc., this is not accessible to the normal Western body as an adult. Children can do it, but most Western adults can't. So while we heard that it's important to draw the lower abdomen in toward the spine to assist to restore natural original movement in the 1980s, most people's attempt at doing this actually causes repression of natural movement. And most people's attempt at trying to stabilize their core has actually inhibited their core and caused stress and not just physiological dysfunction, which is stress, but physical dysfunction in terms of increased back pain, increased weakness. Children, on the other hand, have the accessibility to do this. Children are closer to natural movement. And often by observing children and by trying to restore that childlike function, both in terms of the way you move, the way you hold the posture, the way you breathe, the way you think, following children is a good clue. The way you see children move, especially natural children, and also the way 
internal martial artists and traditional original yogis move is active movement from the core with natural breathing and it always happens in a fluid-like fashion. And this has been really lost in the West. Now, as a long-standing yoga practitioner, I've been blessed to have been given various forms of yoga for, this is my 50th year of having been introduced to yoga. I was lucky to get it from my father as a child and many other teachers in my teens and then uh, with more familiar names like BKS Iyengar, Patabi Joyce, Sri Deshika Chah in my uh, 20s and 30s and um, numerous other people. I also became a physiotherapist in my 30s and, and tried to have some sort of understanding from a Western sense. The core itself contains a plexus of nerves called the enteric nervous system. And the enteric nervous system is a massive network of nerves that resides here. It's wrapped around the intestines. It is more nerves than there is in the entire spinal cord, more nervous tissue than there is in your spine, your spinal cord, and more nervous tissue in this enteric nervous system located in your gut region than there is in a cat's brain. Now, cats are very smart, so this is a significant thing. It's called the enteric nervous system. It's part of your autonomic or automatic nervous system that is actually bigger than the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous systems. It's actually only been really studied and understood in the last 30 years. But more and more now, we're realizing what the ancients of India and China and other traditional cultures have been saying the whole time, that original movement starts physically at the core, and what happens is your main thinking brain has a thought, transfers it to what's called the action brain here. And then the action brain sends out the movement from the core. And this action brain is called various things in different cultures, the Kanda or Manipura Chakra in India, the Dantian in China, the Hara in, in Japan. And this is the root of original movement. Now with the modern push to tighten the core and lock the spine and maintain a neutral spine, this is being diminished, this is being lost. And for a while, as a yoga practitioner, physiotherapist, I tried to take on some of these ideas, like keep a neutral spine, like tighten the core, like just breathe into the chest and breathe out to the tummy. Some of these ideas are being taught around the world quite commonly. And the idea of move the spine through its full range of movement is not as popular as it should be since this is part of natural movement. We were designed to move forward, backwards, side to side, twist at every vertebrae in the spine. This gives the possibility that if you add up all the spinal joints and all the joints in the body, that our body is capable of over 8 billion different individual positions when you work it out mathematically. But most of that is lost if you simply lock the core, open your chest or open the heart center, as many teachers talk about, and pull the shoulders back and down and fold forward from the hips, maintaining a neutral spine. This is very, very common, commonly taught in modern yoga, uh, modern exercise therapy, and it's just not healthy. It's just not right. We can call it okay to do, at certain times, like for example, if the spine hurts when you move it, then it may be okay to exhale fully, draw the navel to the spine with the exhalation muscles and keep the spine locked and not move it. But if you never use something, if you never move it, then it's going to get very stiff. It's like saying, you've got a sore ankle, let's put a bandage on it, let's keep the bandage on for the rest of your life. It doesn't make sense. But to lock the ankle with a bandage while it's healing is fine. To lock your spine and not move it while it's tender, maybe that's fine. But generally, you take the bandage off the ankle, you take the lock off the spine and you move freely. That's what children do, that's what traditional cultures have done all over the world. So, as a physiotherapist and long-time yoga practitioner, I'm keen to share this information with the world. So I try and follow these four principles getting people to move actively from the core 
with natural breathing as their first mode of breath control and doing it fluidly. When I say natural movement, it's natural to cross our arms by doing that. It's completely unnatural to cross your arms by picking up one hand and pulling it onto the shoulder and then using the other hand in a floppy, throwing-like way to throw your arm into the other side. But this is often what people do with their legs to come into a lotus posture. For example, one limb grabs the other and pulls it up onto the thigh. You know, maybe pull the leg behind the head. You can grab your leg, lift it, and pull it behind the head. This is totally unnatural. Flexible, natural-bodied people all over the world, including mostly children who I've met in the West, but certainly adult yoga practitioners brought up in India, for example, in a traditional lifestyle, can easily lift one leg behind their head, other leg behind the head, while their palms are on the chest. This is natural movement. And it's much closer to the idea of original movement, that when you move, you don't just use one hand to pull another limb. You move the limb with the muscles of that limb. You move the spine with the muscles of the spine. So for example, if I'm twisting, I don't take my hand on the knee and use my hand to pull my spine to the left. I simply lift and turn my spine with the muscles that control the spine. And this is much closer to natural movement. Imagine if you had to reverse park, and when reverse parking, to look behind you, you took your hand on the knee, pulled yourself to the left in order to look behind you. You'd have to take your hands off the steering wheel. That would be silly. Natural movement is moving actively from the core, and it has to be with natural breathing. Natural breathing is you breathe in to the core region using your diaphragm, you make a passive breath out. Natural breathing, there's not much of it. You can't hear it, you can't see it when someone is in a restful, calm state. But what many people are teaching in the world today actually disables natural breathing and locks the spine. Many people force an exhale into the abdomen to pull the tummy in, and that will lock the spinal muscles with the oblique muscles. And the chest is the only place left to breathe because it also inhibits the diaphragm. And this basically inhibits natural movement. So I'm trying to restore natural movement by telling people to breathe naturally into their abdomen and out passively. In the modern world of yoga, that sounds like I'm saying something completely opposite to everyone else. But what I'm saying is go back to this first step. Because original movement and natural movement is what children do. It's what traditional people do. But the yogis of old India and the internal martial artists or monks perhaps of China and other parts of the world have learned very special skills, which we might call supernatural. So the supernatural skills are what they talk about in the sutras of Patanjali in the third chapter. Most people practicing yoga or any sort of movement art are not going to learn how to become supernatural. But if you even want to think of supernatural, the first thing to appreciate and to recognize is that we're not natural people. The West is a very unnatural place. We are unnatural people living in an unnatural world. We are normal, and normal is not natural. So the first step we all need to make before even considering supernatural abilities of yoga that yoga promises is to go from the normal world to the natural world. And the natural world is what children do, what traditional cultures do. They move actively from the core with natural breathing. They do it fluidly. And so it's this that I'm trying to restore into the movement, posture, and breathing classes that I teach, which in different circles sometimes they're called yoga to some groups that I teach. Other groups, I call it exercise-based physiotherapy. But really, it's an understanding of everything I've gotten in my practice and learning as a yoga practitioner, a physiotherapist, and all the other things that I've learned in my life. When I say move actively from the core, 
also means in the beginning, don't use things like gravity. A very popular pose in yoga, for example, is the dog posture, the downward facing dog and the upward facing dog. Most people collapse into these poses using gravity. And what happens is you get strain on the shoulders in the downward facing dog, you get strain on the lower back in the upward facing dog, and these postures then become dangerous. And so rather than teaching these postures to my newer students, I'll teach something simple like this for downward facing dog, which gives you the shape of downward facing dog from my hips to my arms, or at least in my spine, without the risk of damaging shoulders. And it has very positive effects, such as increasing blood flow, increasing heat in the body, increasing the flexibility of the spine and removing lower back pain, especially when you really lift your arms. And then instead of doing the upward facing dog pose, which is bending the spine backwards, I simply lean back from standing or sitting and lengthen the front of my body without shortening the back. And this doesn't cause the pinching of the lower back that upward facing dog pose often does to many newer practitioners, but rather it just causes an expansion to the front, a strengthening of the core, and it's minimally stressful and very, very safe for most people. And so I've simplified a lot of the postures of modern yoga and modern calisthenics and made them much more simple spinal movements that are accessible to pretty much anyone. And I've taught them to groups of a thousand people at once, even people in wheelchairs, people with shoulder and neck problems can do them. They're much, much more accessible. Than, than most modern yoga or most modern exercise. But once my senior students have established themselves with these concepts, with these simpler postures, learning how to restore original natural movement from the core with natural breathing actively, then I can give all the postures that are currently being taught in modern yoga, in modern exercise, and there's a very different effect. It's a very, very powerful, different effect. You start to develop strength without feeling tense. Flexibility without the risk of painful or dangerous stretching exercise. You start to improve blood flow, improve circulation, but there's no increase in the rate of the heartbeat. You start to develop internal energy without having to breathe so much. And your body starts to develop an intelligence at a cellular level rather than having to think what to do with your brain to do things safely and effectively. Of course, some people don't think in their practice, but do very, very dangerous exercise and don't think at all. What you want is to have the body do a practice for you without the brain having to labor, to get a good effect without making it a, a head trip. And uh, if you do all this then, you start to get what I consider to be yoga. And yoga is a sense that you realize that you are connected within yourself and that you have a place, a connection within the world as a whole. And I think the ultimate uh, expression of what yoga is, is that yoga is the realization that our individual consciousness is one with the universal consciousness. And it sounds massively globally enhanced to actually think that. I know I don't wake up in the morning going, yes, I am one with the universal consciousness. So what I do is I work with just my body. And every day I get up, I try and connect my body. And it's magical to really appreciate that our body is a family of 50 trillion individual consciousnesses. And in my previous career, I was a molecular biologist. And you can take human cells, put them in a dish, grow them, and they act and behave like individuals. And more and more, the evidence suggests that we are not one consciousness. What we think of as one consciousness within our body is actually a group consciousness of 50 trillion individual souls, every cell, actually represents a soul. And each soul works together in our body to create what we think of as us, our consciousness, our oneness. But actually our oneness is the union 
of 50 trillion individual consciousnesses. And that doesn't even include a number which is probably greater, again, of the bacteria that live within us, the viruses that live within us, which probably also, also have their individual consciousnesses that work symbiotically with ours. And each cell has inside it mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of each cell, which actually act like little bacteria inside our cells, which probably have their consciousnesses as well. So our body is the sum total of many, many trillions of individual consciousnesses. And our perfect health, which we can get or restore to the natural state through good physical practice of posture, movement, breathing, mental control, which we could call yoga, physical hatha yoga. You could also call it Pilates. You could also call it qigong. You could also call it martial arts, dance, any number of activities. Once original movement has been restored, in other words, this concept of moving actively from the core with natural breathing, with flow, which is what you see in children, in traditional cultures, in experienced martial artists, internal martial artists and dancers, which is what physiotherapy has suggested in the modern researchers in physiotherapy and other uh, body sciences. Then your body ends up in perfect health. Your internal organs respond in harmony to the movements of the arms and legs. In yoga, they call the legs the organs of action for the lower internal organs, digestive system, reproductive system. The arms, when they're used properly, become the organs of action for the heart, the lungs, the thymus gland. So when you move properly, when you take yourself from one posture to the next with original natural movement, then you get perfect health in your musculoskeletal anatomy. Bones and joints work better, muscles work better. And more importantly, in your physiology, blood flows better, the nerves work better, your internal organs work better. And this is what gives you longevity and health. And this longevity and health is what we're really looking for. If you want to get enlightenment, it doesn't happen overnight. The longer you live, the more you're likely to understand your purpose as a human being. And when we understand our purposes, then maybe we can get on with being practical and helping other people understand their purpose and understanding maybe that we are all connected as one universal consciousness. But I think it has to start with ourselves. To recognize first that we are connected to recognize that the 50 trillion consciousnesses inside ourselves are working together in harmony. To do this, you've got to move energy through the body, move blood through the body. That movement, that circulation of energy and information through the body is what we could call the essence of physical yoga. Because when there is communication, then there is connection. But if you want perfect health, the information that's being transmitted, the communication between, say, your knee and your brain, has to be a loving communication. The information between your liver and your kidney has to be a loving, sharing communication. If one part of the body decides to be a little bit more dominant than another part, you get ill health. Cancer is your own cells becoming a little bit greedy in what they're doing and dominating other cells. It creates imbalance. Perfect health is when there is proper communication through the body, which on a physical level means good blood flow on one level. But then what type of communication? It has to be loving communication. Your liver has to love your kidney and treat it like it's someone it loves. Your brain has to love the rest of the body. And when this loving communication is transmitted, then the body helps itself and the body acts in perfect health. And what this can mean then is if you appreciate that this is what you're doing in your practice, trying to encourage the flow of energy and loving information 
inside your body, which makes your 50 trillion individual cells, individual consciousnesses, act as one global consciousness that you call you, or I call I, and it's the happy I, the happy, healthy me, or you, or I. Then you get this message that says, hmm, if this is a good way for me to treat me, and this is a good way of my 50 trillion individual consciousnesses to come together and feel as one, maybe this is how we have to be with each other in the world. And maybe if every individual person did this and started treating every other person like they were part of one massive global organism, then maybe the world would be a better place. And so I think it's our responsibility to take the time every day to restore some sort of original movement, some sort of original practice, make the body start acting as it should in a natural way. And when you do that and move naturally from one posture to the next, with natural movement, natural breathing, that starts actively from your core in a fluid-like manner, because energy moves in smooth curves, not in jagged lines, then the movement of energy and loving information goes through your body and reminds you that's perfect health for you and perfect health for the world would be the recognition that that's how you treat other people and that's how everyone should treat everyone else. I think that ultimate connection you see in a mother and a child, a young mother, which I'm not obviously, but I've seen it in so many mothers, a young baby comes from inside them it grew inside them, it was part of them. And suddenly it's outside, but they remember this is part of me and they treat it totally with a love that is totally selfless, total devotion. And it's funny because sometimes you read in the yoga texts about things like non-violence as being a main axiom of Hatha Yoga, they call it Ahimsa. But actually to translate it as non-violence it's horrible. Imagine picking up a baby and going, I'm not going to be violent to you. It's the complete opposite of violence that you want. You want to treat something with total gentleness, total love. And if you translate yoga to be a way of treating yourself the way a mother treats a young baby, and then recognizing that's how everyone should treat everyone else, then your personal practice becomes of value to the world. And then you can realize that the main reason we're here really is to enjoy our lives, to look after our bodies and be in perfect health within ourselves, and then try and make that happen in the world, help other people enjoy their lives and help the world connect as a whole. Perhaps that's why we're here. And that's why original movement and Restoring natural movement is a good goal, and that's the way I've been trying to do it. Thank you.